Hello and good evening and welcome to all as we start off this week's Wednesday night live entitled the Kingdom series. I am Anita and I welcome you once more as you join in on tonight on the Kingdom series. I hope that you had a great day today and as you come on into the live, feel free to like and to share as we continue to unlock and to unveil the kingdom of God, to understand our place in the kingdom of God and to understand who God is through his words. So I welcome you tonight as you join on, like and share. I hope you enjoy some beautiful instrumental worship this evening as you come on. And I have a really powerful word for you tonight and it's entitled seven steps to restoration of your soul in the kingdom of God something that we will all truly benefit from something that we all need in our lives which is the re restoration of our soul so I welcome you this evening and if you are interested in learning how you can be restored how your soul can be restored to wholeness to fullness to wellness to you know to full joy and to the fullness of God in your life you are in the right place and I'm going to share with you tonight seven steps to restoration of your soul in the kingdom of God and just to plug this in here everything that I share is something that I've actually experienced something that I've actually lived and something that I can testify of that you know has actually worked in my life and has actually I've actually seen it come to fruition in my life so I'm not just saying it I've actually lived it and these steps to restoration is, is are the steps that I actually followed in my own life to become restored to become healed to become renewed as a kingdom child as a child of God in the kingdom of heaven so I welcome you on this evening as you come on like and share the live this is the kingdom series and we are back here once more so i hope everyone is doing well today was extremely hot in trinidad and tobago listen to me oh my god wow <laughs> i went out today to run some errands good evening wandel i see wandel is on always on every single week god bless you and i pray that tonight will be an absolute blessing to you how are you where where are you at right now wendell how is the how is the temperature where you are at right now it was i think today was probably the hottest day in the year i i don't know i just it felt like the hottest day in the year it was crazy hot and i went out to do some errands and by the time i got back i'm still battling a residual headache from the heat and from the dehydration it was crazy so i can imagine how you know you all feel but it's good to you know be home it's good to be settled in i thank god for keeping us and i thank him you're okay so what's the temperature like offshore where you are right now is it hot is it hot like here <laughs> or the sea breeze is keeping you cool i hope so the sea breeze usually keeps you very very cool so blessings to you blessings to all as you all come on tonight the kingdom series and tonight we are talking about seven steps to restoration of your soul in the kingdom of heaven so without further ado let's open up in a word of prayer and we're gonna get into this power-packed message tonight and I know that somebody is going to be set free tonight somebody's gonna to be healed somebody's gonna be transformed somebody's gonna be restored tonight your soul your soul is going to be restored in the name of Jesus tonight so father we give you all the praise Lord, we give you all the honor, we give you all the glory. We come together in the matchless name of Jesus Christ tonight. And Father, we come before your throne and we say thank you, God, for life today. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and to learn from you, to draw from you, God, to draw from your throne room, to your wisdom, your knowledge, my God, Jesus, and your anointing. And I thank you, God. I thank you for this revelation tonight that you are about to give to us tonight. I, I thank you, Lord, that it would be received by everyone who hears it tonight, Lord. Father, I pray that everything I say tonight will be of you, Father, Lord Jesus, and it will go forward with your power and authority. And I thank you, God, that at the end of this 
live tonight that somebody somebody will be restored their soul shall be restored as you have purpose it in jesus name amen yes record breaking temperatures my goodness it's crazy so we are talking about restoration tonight it's a very 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 important very important uh, uh topic that we need to to really get into we really need to get deep in because it's something we all need and who can agree with me when i say this that this world is currently a bunch of hurt people walking around hurting other people i know if you i know there are people out there who will agree with me and if you agree with me you can drop a yes in the comment good night to natasha good night to my sister natasha it's so great to have you on tonight blessings to you and we are talking about how can your soul be restored god is after the restoration of your soul and it's something that a lot of people don't talk about but we need to talk about it because god is interested in your soul being restored, renewed, healed, and made whole. He needs us to be whole. He needs us to be whole. And by the time I'm finished tonight, I pray that you are going to understand how important your the healing of your soul is to your God tonight. So let's get into it. So I broke it down into seven steps. And as I said, it's actually things that I actually put into place in my life. I was a hot mess without Jesus in my life. I was a hot mess. And I thank God that I could have learned and I could have grown and I could have been restored in the name of Jesus. So I broke it down, seven steps that I said I actually lived i actually put into practice and i have actually seen the results i've seen the success of it i've seen it come to fruition in my life so it is a word of testimony along with it being biblical because i i, I always base my messages on the scriptures and the scriptures alone so tonight we're talking about the seven steps what are the seven steps easy easy steps and the first one the first one is to know your identity and understand who you are to God. Who are you to God? Who are you? Have you ever asked yourself that? And I just wanna unveil what the Spirit of God has been speaking and speaking to my heart concerning restoration because God wants to restore his children. So we, in order to understand your true identity, in jesus we need to go back to the beginning and i always say that we need to go back to the beginning and if you've been following the kingdom series over the past month or months i can't remember how long it's been but you will always hear me say we need to go back to the beginning we need to go back to genesis and understand god's original plan for mankind and this was found in genesis chapter one when he said let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So right there is the testimony of God's original intent for you and for me, for all mankind. Once you're a human being, that you fall under this category. When he said, let us make man in our likeness and image, God's original intention was for us to be a representative, an image of him, carrying his likeness and image, carrying his holiness, carrying his righteousness, carrying everything that he is. That was who he created us to be. And it's very sad because when man plunged into sin, we fell away from the relationship. But God being God and God being the awesome, wonderful, loving father that he is, he immediately created that plan of salvation in order to get us back to that place of kingdom relationship. And one word I want you to take tonight and really plant it in your heart is this word called sonship. And when I say sonship, I'm not just referring to men. Sonship encompasses all of us, meaning sons and daughters of God. And that is who we are. And that is something we really need to open our eyes and understand that, that in our, our identity in Jesus, once you accept the Lord Jesus into your life, once you believe in Jesus, once you have 
come under that blood covenant, you are now in the sonship relationship with your father. You are no longer just that sinful human that you used to be. You are now the son or the daughter of God. You are restored to sonship and this is what we really need to take home. Take it home tonight and you are restored to sonship. But I'm going to say something tonight that is going to help us understand why we still cannot identify. We might say, we might say that we are sons. We might say that we are daughters. But we are really truly not walking in our sonship. We are really not truly walking in who we truly are in God because we still we still have in the back of our minds we still have wherever in the subconscious mind still have that belief that we are still apart from god and there's a reason for this and i'm going to break it down for you as the spirit of god has he has been god has been speaking to me he's been he's been filling my mind with this thing 24 7 and he's been speaking about restoration and i can testify to you when God speaks about something, it is because he wants to activate it. He wants to get it done. He wants to do it in your life. And in order for us to get it done, he needs us to understand. So let's talk about sonship. And let's talk about why we, when we come to Jesus Christ, we st it's still difficult for us to really acknowledge and understand our sonship we always go back to feeling that we are nothing and nobody we always go back to feeling that we are sinful we always go back to feeling that we are worthless we always go back to feeling like that there is a reason why and i'm going to share it with you now so as i said when man fell out of uh, a um, relationship with god in the garden and between that time to the time when Jesus came and was crucified, can you picture all that time? There was no Holy Spirit. There was no payment of sin. So that was thousands of years. Thousands of years that humanity was under their pure sinful nature, their pure human nature, because there was no Holy Spirit living inside of man to assist or help man to come back to relationship with God. So in all those years, people would have been identifying themselves as sinful and as, 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 as broken. And this is true. This is true. However, now, let's talk about now. We are no longer like that. Once we are back into our relationship with our Heavenly Father, we are restored to sonship. But I want to I wanna take it even further. And I want to take you back. Tonight, I want to take you back to that time. Think back, very, very far back. Well, if it's like me, 42 years ago, when you were born, I want you to think back to the time that you were born. Think about that perfect baby that, that came out of your mother's womb. That pure, innocent child that would have come out of your mother's womb, you would have been pure. Now, we all know that man is made up of three parts. You have a spirit man, you have a soul, and you have your fleshly nature. Don't confuse your fleshly nature with your soul. Don't confuse it. That is a mistake people make, and that's why we identify our souls as, 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 as nothing, as no good. But your fleshly nature is simply a sinful nature that we inherited. We can't help that. That's who we are as human beings. However, your soul, your soul is who you are. I wrote something about it today, and I really want to read it. Let me just get that where I put about the soul. I'll find it in a bit. But I want to explain to you about your soul. Your soul is you. It's who you are. It's the essence of who God created you to be. And every single person has an individuality. Every single person's soul is different. The soul is who you are. It's the essence of who you are. It's, it's where God knit you together. He said, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. 
So while you were being formed in your mother's womb, perfect and beautiful, your soul at that time would have been untouched by carnality. You would have been perfect, that soul, that soul of that baby. You would have been perfect. You would not have had any yeah, any wounds in your soul at that time. So when that, that is who you are, that is who you are, that original person who God made you, that beautiful soul. The soul is where God placed everything unique about you. That's where he put your gifts. That's where he put your talents. That's where he put everything special and unique about you. And that is where he put your purpose. And in all this, this tonight, we are really going to focus on purpose. God created each and every human being on this planet with a purpose, with a purpose. And that purpose was to, you know, uh, to lend to and to influence and to inspire and to build your environment around you. God put unique talents and gifts inside of you that would have been used to, to, to put a great impact in this earth, to make a difference in this world. That's why he brought you here. You are not a mistake. You know, sometimes we say that babies are mistakes. They said I was a mistake, you know, but nobody, no human life is a mistake. You are here for a reason and a purpose. And your soul would have been not contaminated at that time. Your soul would have been pure as a baby growing up. That now, now, now we're gonna take a step further. Think about when you started to experience life and you started to understand life as a child growing up. Then you now would have had experiences. And sad to say, a lot of us would have had bad experiences as children growing up, as babies. From, we would have grown up in bad environments. I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of us. It's a sad reality because we live in a fallen world. And our parents may have been just as broken and their brokenness allowed them to raise us in broken environments. So let's, let's just think, think back. We may have grown up in abusive homes. We may have grown up in poverty. We may have grown up, you know, in violence. We may have grown up in a lot of corruption. Whatever the situation that you would have been growing up in at that time, those things started to wound your soul. Picture your soul as a piece of paper. And every time something happened to hurt you, it just puts a wound in your soul. It puts a wound in your soul. So your soul ends up getting pierced, 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 pierced. This perfect, beautiful soul that God created, it starts to get pierced. And it's wounded. It's wounded. Your soul becomes wounded. And over the years, the more things you experience, the more wounds you experience. And I know that there are many people who understand that what I'm saying here today, I could definitely tell you that I was one of those people. I had many wounds in my soul. I grew up in poverty. I grew up with domestic violence. I grew up with my, 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 my abandonment. My both parents left home. So there were many, many things. And I know that so many people here tonight have the same things. We grew up with wounds in our soul, you know, and, and, and sadly, it's the enemy who uses these wounds and this, these environments. Let me read what I wrote here today for you. The soul is the very essence of who you are, your unique identity as created and purposed by God. Your soul carries your special characteristics, your gifts, your talents, your purpose. And this is why the battle is so fierce for your soul. Why do you think that the enemy attacks your soul? Why? Why does he attack your soul? He knows that if he wounds you in your soul, you'll be broken. From the time you were born, the enemy would have done everything in his power to contaminate and to damage your soul because he knows that a broken soul would keep us far from our true identity in God. And I want us to understand this. All these things that have happened to us over the years, it's the enemy's plan to keep us away from knowing our true identity in God. 
He wants to wound us. You see, if we wounded and we broken and we hurt, we are going to be so focused on that pain, we're not gonna think about anything else. I know you know what I'm talking about. If you know what I'm talking about, drop an amen in the comments. Let's go down. The enemy used many experiences from our birth, he used our environment, circumstances, whatever it is to pierce our soul with wounds. And as I said, picture your soul as a piece of paper and every time something happens, it pierces a hole and it pierces a hole and it pierces a hole. So this is why I said, it's a lot of us walking around with bruised, broken souls and these negative experiences, hear what I'm saying now, the negative experiences and the wounds in your soul are the starting point and the foundation for the enemy to build his lies and strongholds in our minds. We all hear about strongholds. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? Strongholds are the holes that the enemy has in our mind and they start off by that wound, that pain that you have inside of you. Let me give you an example. So, as I said, when you're, let's just say, as a little girl, your father left home at a very young age, left home and abandoned you. You as this little girl have this wound in your soul. You have a wound of abandonment. It's pain inside of you because it hurts that your father left you. Girls, we know how it is that we want this father's love. We know. I'm just giving you an example of how the enemy starts to build strongholds in your mind. So let's just say you are abandoned by your father as a child. So you have that pain inside of you. You're wounded in your soul with this thing. The devil comes in now and he uses that as a foundation to build a stronghold. Picture it as he putting some cement on that to keep it there. That's what a stronghold is. He putting a cement on that wound so that it's not going to get healed. And how does he do that? He does it with lies. So over the years in your life, the devil now will take that wound in your soul because you have this hurt of abandonment and he will start to tell you things like everybody's going to leave you. Nobody loves you. Everybody, you're going to have to start to develop this fear of abandonment. You're going to start to develop trust issues. And he's going to start whispering, whispering in your ears. Don't trust nobody. Don't trust no men. It have no good men. So you're growing up with this mentality now that men, all men do is leave you. Because the enemy has built on this foundation of this hurt and wounded soul and told you these lies. And now you are taking that and it's built a stronghold in your mind. Now, as I said, it's like a chain reaction. You now react to the people around you with this thing. And I'm going to say it here. We begin to respond to life from a wounded soul filled with negative beliefs. A stronghold is a negative belief. So when you start these negative beliefs inside of you, then you are responding to life from this negative standpoint. Everything that happens around you, it is clouded by this perspective of this negative belief. I'm going to give you another example. Let's say you grew up very poor. I grew up very poor. And let's say you grew up very poor. So the enemy now has, he knows that other wound is in your soul, you know. Because being poor, it ain't no joke and it ain't easy. And he comes now and he takes that wound in your soul from being poor and he will start to tell you things like, you see, you don't have nothing. And you start to, do you start to think that, you start to think that, hey, you know what? I wouldn't, I, I always had to, I always had to catch my skin. I always had to work so hard. I could never get what I want. I could never have money. Every time I have money, it always go in. Those, does those things sound familiar to you? Then we start to claim it. We start to speak it. And it becomes our reality. It becomes our reality. And we, this is how we living with under the lies of the devil because he has placed this stronghold he picture it he's placed the cement on top of your wound because of the lies and you start to believe it because you don't know any better you don't know any better and that's the easiest way to put it i didn't know any better there was nobody to tell me I knew Jesus, but there was nobody to teach me this, what I'm saying here tonight. Nobody told me about strongholds in my mind. So the devil was having a field day with me, planting strongholds in my mind. So I grew up believing 
that all men would hurt me, that people would leave me. So even in my relationships, even in my marriage, I was always so insecure because of that stronghold that the enemy placed on the wound on my soul when my father left at a very young age. I always believed. I always had the insecurity when I was in my, you know, with my husband. I always felt that he was going to do something. He was going to cheat on me. He was going to leave me. And I would act out because of that. And I know somebody is relating to what I'm saying here tonight. The wounds in our soul allow us to react negatively. We can't see things clearly. Everything we do, everything we experience, everything we, we process, we, we process in it through this filter of all the pain and all the hurt and whatever is in our soul. And this is what God wants to fix. I give God thanks. I thank the Father, Jesus Christ, that He, He wants to fix it. He wants to tear off all these lies of the enemy off of you off of me off of his children because he loves us and the devil for too long yes the too long the devil has had us in this bondage i want to read the scripture for you it is a powerful scripture and it's taken from the book of luke chapter 4 and this is what jesus spoke this was prophesied this was prophesied by the the prophet isaiah about Jesus Christ, what he came to earth to do. He did not just come to earth to die on a cross. He came to earth to restore his children. It is evidence in here. Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read from verse uh, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and he, as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Heal the brokenhearted, hallelujah, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This scripture right here is telling you, if you didn't believe me, believe the word of God when he says he came here to heal the broken hearted. Oh my Jesus, thank you. Jesus, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We have been oppressed by our wounds in our soul and by the enemy's strongholds for too long. It is time for us to be set free. Do you know that there are so many believers? There are people who, have, who are believers in Christ and they are still walking around broken because they do not understand that your, the Father wants to restore you. It is available and he wants to do it. So what is the next step? So as I said, the first step was to understand your identity. And I hope that now you understand your identity is not that sinful human that you used to be. Because when you came to Jesus Christ, guess what? You are not just human. We all like, love to say, I'm just a human. You are not just human. Tonight, you are going to understand, you are not just human. You carry the spirit of the living God inside of you. So you are a beautiful blend of humanity and divinity. You are now in Jesus. You are not just human. Don't put yourself down in that bracket. You are now a beautiful blend, hear me, of humanity and divinity. You carry divinity inside of you. So don't you ever let nobody say, or don't you say to yourself, I don't want anybody to say that anymore. I'm just human. You are not just human. You are not just human. Humanity is a part of you, but you also carry the Spirit of God inside of you. The Holy Spirit, the power of God rests inside of you. You are not just human. I, 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 that blew my mind, you know. You are a mix of humanity and divinity in Jesus. 
in Jesus. Without him, we are a whole mess. Without him, we are just human. So if you are not in Jesus, you could probably say you're just human. But when you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a mixture of humanity and you carry divinity inside of you. You are not just human. Do not put yourself back in that bracket. I want to read, oh my God, this scripture for you tonight. Beautiful scripture. Romans 8, 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Hallelujah. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Touch yourself right now and say, I am the child of God. I carry the spirit. The spirit bear witness inside of me that I, because the Lord said so. The Lord said so. And here this beautiful part. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then is is of God and joint is with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. You are no longer just human. You are son and daughter of the living God. The spirit of God is bearing witness inside of you of that. And you are now an heir together with Jesus Christ because our God has shared everything that he has with us. The only thing that God doesn't share with us is his glory. He's not sharing his glory. We need to understand that part. He will, he will share his power. He will share his, the blessings. He will share everything else, but he's not sharing his glory. We are not to take that part. That's his and his alone. Nobody else is going to take his glory. No flesh shall glory in his presence. Amen. So all this to say, understand that you are a son or a daughter. You are no longer orphans. Jesus said so. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And how he come into us in the Holy Spirit. So this is such a, a, a beautiful topic tonight. I, I am in love with this topic and God has really been pouring out this message into me and I hope you receive it tonight. So let's get into the second step of restoration and I know I'm going on a bit long, but it's worth it. The second step to being restored in your soul is to, to desire it. You must desire it. And it might sound simple. It might sound like, yeah, of course I want it. But do you really want it? You have to want it. There is a saying that a hundred men could lead a horse to water, but nobody could make him drink it. And you need to understand that in order to want to, to, to be restored in your soul, in order to, to want God to change, you have to say yes to God. You can listen to all these sermons, you could read how much scriptures, you could do what you want, but if you don't have that deep desire inside of you to, to, to want to be healed, you are not going to be healed. Nobody could lay hands on you and make it happen. You have to want it. It has to be a desire. Whatever you desire in life, sorry, whatever you want, it has to be a desire. So I'm gonna use the parable tonight of the prodigal son. And I'm gonna use that parable, I'm gonna break it down for you, and I'm gonna show you the steps of restoration in relation to this parable. It was something so beautiful that the Spirit of God opened up to my eyes using the parable of the prodigal son to show us how we could be restored into the kingdom of heaven, our soul, our soul. And I know everybody knows this, the story of the, the prodigal son, I'm gonna read it again for you. Luke 15, 11 to 32. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, then he arose, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to the fields to feed swine, to feed swine. It's not where we were. We were there. We were there. We may have not been feeding swine, but we were in that kind of dejected state. And he would gladly have filled the stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. I love this part. 
But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread and enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Jesus and the son said to him father I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son is that how we feel isn't that how we feel we're no longer worthy because we know the things we've done we know the things that we have done in our past so we, we feel unworthy just like him look at the beautiful part next but the father said to the servant bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found jesus hallelujah wow so think about what the, the, we, we were talking about desiring desiring restoration when the prodigal son came to himself what did he do he made a decision. He said, I will arise and go to my father's house. And this is what I'm saying. Many believers are walking around just like the prodigal son. They're in this dejected state and they don't know that they could get up and go into their father's house because there is restoration in there. So today make a decision and say, I will arise and go to my father's house. I am not going to live in this condition of hurt and pain no more. I don't want that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Don't you want your life to be full? Think about it. So many of us living in the past still. We, we, we living in 2022, but in our minds, all the years that went by and all the bad things that happened to us, we still replaying this thing in our mind and we living in a prison of our own minds and our head because we just replaying, 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 replaying the thing over and over. And we are, can't even ex enjoy life now. We can't even enjoy the fullness of being God's child now because we still living in the past. And guess what? What did the Bible say? As far as the east is from the west, so far put, put your transgressions for me. God already forget that. He already put it in the past, you know, but we still living there. We, we need to come out from the past. We need to separate ourselves from the prison of our mind and understand, I will arise, like he said, I'm gonna rise and go to my father's house. I'm coming out of this dejected state. I'm coming out of this bruised state. I'm coming out of this hurt. I am coming out. I need to come out. I'm not living there no more because there's nothing there left for me. According to, according to that, that politician, nobody lives there. The past is the past, it's dead and done. Nobody lived there no more. Come out from there. Come out from there. Come out from the past. Come out. There is nothing left for you in the past. Nothing. It's done. And that hurt and pain, God is going to deal with it now. He is going to fix that for you. He is going to fix it for you. But you have to make the decision to say, I don't want to live there no more. I'm not living in the past no more. I'm not living in, I'm not going to, no, 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 guys, no. We need to come out. We need to arise. Come out of that pigsty in our mind and come out and go back to our father's house. We are sons. We are daughters. Amen. So the next step, as I said, we must desire it. The next step, repent, confess, surrender. Easy. It's not hard. God made it so easy for us, you know. We don't need to go and confess our sin before nobody. We don't need to go and stand up in front of anybody and tell them how we're broken. All we need to do is go and close our door, go in our prayer closet and tell Jesus. He ain't going to tell a soul. He's not going to tell anybody what, what you told him. Where you can't trust, man? Let me tell you something. The, the Bible says, go into your room and close your door and pray to your father in secret. Go to your father. When the lost son returned home, what the first thing he did? What the first thing he did? He said, Father, I sinned against heaven and your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Why, he, why did he say that? He was ashamed of, you know, his life and he was ashamed of what he did. And we must be willing to humble ourselves before God and say, Father, I know that I'm broken. Father,
Father, I know, I know, I know. I know I'm carrying these things inside of me. Father, it hurts. Father, I know I'm carrying unforgiveness inside of me, you know. I know. I can't even don't bring myself to forgive these people. I don't know how to do it. Confess. Let us all out. Humble yourself and say, God, I don't know how to do this thing. You have to help me. You see, when we come to God with that humility, we are saying and we are acknowledging to him that we need him. Because I'm certain, just like I used to do for many years, try to fix the thing by myself trying to do it by myself. It never worked. It never worked, guys. It never worked. Have any of you tried to fix something on your own and it worked? Tell me. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Doing it on your own, trying to do it by yourself, it ain't gonna work. And yes, Natasha, pride kills. I ain't got no pride. When I go before God, I say, Father, I just don't know how to fix this thing, you know. I don't know. There are many times, you know, even to let go of things and to let go of hurt and let go of pain and let go of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is one of the hardest things to let go. Let's talk about that for a minute. That trauma and that pain, that hurt, most times it would happen because people would have done things to us, yes? The trauma and the pain that we carry in our souls is not just because it is 99, I would say maybe 100% of the time because of things that people would have done or we are experienced hurt because of people's actions in our life so just that 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 just un makes us understand that unforgiveness just goes along with this thing called trauma because we have a hard time to say we forgive the people who've done things to us and i have been there it took me years to forgive certain people because of the the depth of the trauma it took me years to forgive my father it took me years to forgive my mother it took me years to forgive the the man who abused me because i was in an abusive relationship it took me years to forgive but eventually i did because i kept on going to god and saying help me help me help me help me help me and this is another point restoration of your soul does not happen overnight because if you think about it all the things that happened to you over the years it didn't happen overnight, right? We acquired all these pains and things and things inside of us over many years. I always use the description of an onion. Think of an onion. There's layers and layers and layers and layers. And as you come to God, He does it. He takes off layer by layer. He can't just strip it off all at once. He takes time. It takes time. It takes time. For the past four years, God has been restoring me. He's still doing a restorative work in my life. But every time He does it, it's He's taking off something and something and something again and he's restoring and taking out that pain and putting back that healing power inside of me and this is what we need to have patience too you know we want to have, be healing like come on guys it takes time god's timing is perfect so let's humble ourselves in the sight of god and just go and say daddy I need you, I can't help it, this, this thing driving me crazy. I need you to get rid of this thing, this insecurity, this pain, this hurt, this brokenness, whatever it is, let him know you need him. And when you humble yourself, what did the Bible say? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. He will do it, humble yourself, just humble yourself. Don't be prideful and think that you could fix this thing for yourself. It ain't gonna happen, right? But surrender is another thing. Surrender is a beautiful word. It's, it sounds hard, but it's the most beautiful thing you could do to help your restoration. Surrender. A lot of people ask me, how did I, you know, how did I change so much so quickly? How did I grow so much so quickly? How did I develop so much so quickly in God? That word surrender is key. I, I, I try my best to live a surrendered life to God, meaning to say, I, I try not to do it my way. I give it all to him. I give it all to him. I say, Father, I don't know. Without you, I'm nothing, and I just need you. We need to learn how to give it to God. Put it down and say, Father, you need to teach me. Show me. Surrender means we trust him completely, and we are now willing to do things his way. Because we know that he alone... Yeah, Lord knows best for us, you know. We feel we know all. We feel we know what's best for us. What did Jeremiah twenty nine eleven say? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. 
plans to give you a hope and a future and in that hope and future it's the restoration of you the, the wounds in your soul it's included in there it is included inside of there so let's surrender let's trust him don't try to do it on your own don't try to say i know how to do this thing and i because I can guarantee you it's not going to work, but we need to surrender. It means that we're willing now to hear God's voice, to listen to his instructions, and also to work together with him to do it for him to heal us. Because in order for him to heal us, we have to work together with him. So when he say, uh, Anita, okay, I need you to forgive this person. Anita has to now go and work to forgive the person because if I don't, then I can't get rid of that pain inside of me. It works hand in hand. God works together with us. He said he's the help. The, the Holy Spirit is the helper. Paracletos. He's a helper. He works. He works alongside with us. It's not just we lying down there and he just doing the work. We have to do our part. So let's repent. Let's confess. Let's surrender. Ask him. Say, I need you, God, to help me. And when he speaks, do. This is an important thing. When God speaks to you concerning your restoration and he says, do something, I want you to please, please don't have pride. Do the thing. Give you an example. Over the past few months gone by, the Lord had me to pick up the phone. He spoke to me concerning picking up the phone and making several phone calls and restoring when I say restoring, sorry, um, making it right with certain people that I had had issues with before god spoke to me concerning this thing and i was like god i have to go pick up the phone to call these people they are the ones who did things to me and god is saying no i need for you to do this thing because in order for you to let go you have to make it right with these people and it was tough for me to do but i want my restoration right i want to be healed i want to be whole so i had to humble myself and pick up the phone call these people and tell them you know you know let's make this thing right even though as i said they were the ones who who you know initiated these issues and had a lot to say or whatever but my point is that when god speaks to you concerning your restoration we have to now listen he speaks through his word and he speaks through his holy spirit so when you spend time with god and you say say father i don't know how to do this thing God might say, okay, again, I will give you an example. I carried around a lot of physical sickness. And when I say, there was nothing wrong with me, you know. I used to just feel sick all the time. Sick, when I say sick, sick. I used to feel like my skin was like like on fire. I used to feel my skin was like, a, like I, I couldn't even describe. I felt as though I was being tortured. I, I think that's the best explanation. And for years I was praying and I was saying, God, I just heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. But then I wasn't getting healed. And then one day I said, I said, Father, okay, it can't be you because you promised that you would heal me. So what is it I need to do that will bring my healing? And God spoke to me. Now he speaks to me a lot in dreams and he showed me in the dream and then he spoke to me the revelation after. He might speak to you a different way. However, he speaks, he, he will speak to you. And he showed me that I was holding on to unforgiveness of that relationship, that abusive relationship that I had in my early 20s. I was holding on to the pain. I was holding on to the unforgiveness. I was holding on to the trauma of it. And that was manifesting itself as physical sickness in my body. This is another thing we have to understand. Trauma and pain and these things manifest itself in physical ways in your body. You might feel sick. You might you know, have sickness in your body and that, that stems from all this pain and trauma in your soul. That's what, one, one of the greatest reasons to just let this thing go. We're not walking around with this thing anymore. So I had to really spend, I spent a week in prayer and fasting just to be able to purge this unforgiveness out of my soul. It took me some time because I didn't want to forgive the individual. Imagine you have to forgive somebody who abused you for five years. But I needed to do because God spoke to me and said, that's how you're going to be restored. And I thank God that today I let go of that unforgiveness. And today I can tell you, I'm, I know that I'm healed in my body. I don't feel like that anymore because God was able to come in with his restorative power. You see, when you have that inside of you taking up space, the spirit of God can't come in. It's blocking. It's blocking, this, it's blocking God from working. So we need to let it go. 
So all this to say, surrender. And when God says do, you do. When God gives you instruction for your restoration, listen and do. Don't be stubborn. That's a big thing. We love to be stubborn. We like to hold on to things and say, well, God, you don't know what these people do. Me. You know something that God said to me the other day? It was so powerful. He said that people say that it's, you don't know how hard it is for me to forgive somebody because God, you don't know what these people do. You don't know how much they hurt me now. They do really hurt me. So God was saying to me, when we sin, when we do things, we hurt God. We hurt God. Do you know when you do something that is unholy or you sin or you do something that's not right? It hurts God because he's a holy being. It hurts him. The Bible says we should not grieve the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. So when we hurt God, but yet, 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 when we go and say, Father, forgive me, what does he do? He forgives us immediately. He don't wait. He said it. If we, are, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. So think about it. If God, who we hurt him, we hurt him. If he could forgive us, why can't we forgive people? And then we, you know, we love to say, well, Lord, you don't know what these people do me. Yes, he does. He does because we've done it to him. He does know the pain because we've done it to him. So let's take that into perspective and think that the same mercy we have he has for us. Let's have it. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Sounding like frozen up in here. Let it go. My goodness. Let's go on because it's, it's going time. But I feel like you talk about this thing whole night. The next step. Seek knowledge of the kingdom and understand your power as a son and daughter of God. We need to understand the power that God has given us. Listen to me. When this prodigal son returned home, he was ashamed, right? He didn't ask, he asked his father, he said, make me one of the hired hands. What did the father do? He didn't do that. He gave him back his place as son. He put the best robe on his son. God restored you to sonship. And with that sonship comes power. Jesus said, listen to me, Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpent and scorpions over all power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And in Matthew 16, 19, he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Hallelujah. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Listen, when you make this decision to say, I am no longer going to hold on to this pain. I'm no longer going to live in this bondage. And I'm coming out. And you say, God help me. And you say, I'm ready. Right. God, we're going to work. We're a team. We're going to work together, Lord. And we're going to do this, this thing. What is going to happen? Listen. If somebody has you in slavery and you try to escape, you think it is going to let you go? The minute you decide that you want to come out of this thing, the devil is going to give you a fight of your life. Why? He had you in this place all these years. You really think he going to just let you go? <laughs> you think he's just going to just say, well, all right, you know, she come to Jesus now. You know, all right. No, the battle is going to intensify. That's where the battle is going to intensify. He's going to fight you, fight you, fight you, fight you down. And this is why your heavenly father in all his wisdom, in all his knowledge and all his beauty, he gave us weapons to fight. He empowered us because he knew the fight would be intense. He knew we'd be in a fight for our freedom. He knows the enemy is going to fight us and say, eh, eh, me and taken because you know the enemy, enemy benefits from your brokenness. The enemy benefits from the brokenness in your soul. So why are he going to let you go? For you to go and, and, and get power to, to go and defeat him? For you to come out and come into your purpose and, and, and bring people to the kingdom of God? For you to come out and, and, and speak out against him and, t and say the lies of the devil? Come on, he ain't going to want that but in jesus listen to me this is why now in order for you to restore you really need to get knowledge get the knowledge seek the knowledge get in the word learn and understand your power as a son as a daughter to defeat the enemy because you're going to need those weapons ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6, the weapons of the the weapon the arm of god god gave us so much things he gave us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He gave us the power to bind. He gave us authority to tread and trample. He gave us the whole armor to put on, put on, to put on. And he gave us the sword of the spirit. It's right here. The sword. He gave us a sword. You know in all the, all the armor, 
in all the, the facets of the armor. The sword of the spirit is the only thing that allows you to inflict harm. Everything else is protective gear. So the helmet is protective gear. The, the breastplate is protective gear. Everything else is protective gear. But the sword of the spirit allows you to inflict some wounds in the enemy. So take it up and use it. Take it up and use it. Take up the sword. The Lord said to me, he said, my children are walking on broken and dejected and the sword of the spirit is in their hand and they don't want to use it. He's given it to you. Take it and use it. Use the word of God. As I said before, last couple of weeks, how do we defeat the adversary? We use the word. We say it is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. So we need to understand. And that brings me to my other point. So when we understand now our power, so we're working now, we're coming up there, we're climbing the ladder. The next step to restoration, big step, replace old habits and beliefs with kingdom truths. A big step. So remember I was saying to you that over the course of your life, the enemy would have allowed your soul to be wounded. And when he allowed your soul to be wounded, he, he built on top of those wounds, he built a stronghold and stuck there of false beliefs, false lies. He might have told you, well, you will always be poor for the rest of your life. You ain't had nothing. Every time I had a word, I, I, have you found yourself saying that? You say things like, I broke, boy. <laughs> Every time I get some money in my hand, it always go in, boy. Every time I, I get, I save enough for something, something always happening. Because he wants us to confess these false truths over our life. And when you confess these false truths over your life, you start to believe it, right? And it becomes your reality. So now, in order to be restored, we need to remove those old things. How do we do that? We replace old habits and beliefs with kingdom truths. So now, whenever you start to think and say, well, you know what? I never have money. Every time I have money, it's always going. We need to go now and we need to say, you need to speak it out, you know. You need to speak it out. You need to say, I detach myself. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. God gave you a mouth power. Listen to me. Open your mouth and say, I detach myself from the lies of the enemy. I no longer believe those lies. And now you need to go and declare the word of God over your life saying that my Jesus say, if I seek first the kingdom of heaven, all else will be added to me. So I have no lack in the kingdom of God. You need to use the word to replace those old words. Don't speak those things over your life. Don't confess it over your life. No more, no more, no more. Don't do it. I know a lot of us like to say, oh, well, I'm depressed or I, whatever. Don't say it. Don't say it. Even if you feel it inside, don't confess it with your mouth. Keep confessing the truth of God's word. By his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. I no longer believe the lies of the enemy. It's going to take some work, you know. My mom was saying, faith without works is that. It's going to take you some work. God has given you the power. He's given you the tools. He's given you the spirit. But you need to now do your part. You need to activate the thing. Activate your healing. It's like, okay, you go to the doctor and you're sick. The doctor gives you a course of antibiotics to take. You now have to take the antibiotics and put it in your mouth. The doctor is not coming to put the antibiotics in your mouth every day. And it's the same thing. You have to do your part. God gave you the word. He gave you the, 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 the strategy. He gave you everything. Take it and use it. So now we are no longer confessing these things over our life. I am saying, okay, you know what? I, and you need to say, I release every unforgiveness. I release every unforgiveness. Because my father say, if I stand to pray, I must forgive. I release every unforgiveness. I release it. I forgive everyone who has hurt me. I forgive the people who have hurt me. I forgive them. I bless them in the name of Jesus. We need to start using our power and authority. I bless them in the name of Jesus. I bless them in the name of Jesus. Because God said, bless and do not curse. Bless those who curse you. You know, pray for them who spiteful use it. So we need to start to use the word of God to activate our healing. Because when we do these things, we are now letting go of all those old strongholds and we are creating room for the spirit of god to come in and move in us and that brings me to my other point the, the next step step number six draw close to god draw close to god so now that we've done all the groundwork of removing the strongholds and taking those things out of our mind now 
No, the power is in the presence. This is the secret here. It's not a secret, but I'm just using that phrase. The power is in the presence. And as you go through your life, I want you to remember that phrase. The power is in the presence. Listen to me. God's power to heal you is in his presence. It's nowhere else. It's in his presence. The scripture said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We were created to live in the presence of God. The presence of God has everything. It's where it's at. And that's why we were given access to the kingdom of heaven. Think about it. We were given access to come back to the kingdom of heaven because God wants us to dwell in his presence. And in his presence, there is the power, the anointing, the healing. Everything that God is, is in his presence. How do we access the presence? We draw near to God. We spend time with him. We worship him. We adore him. We love him. We draw close to him. We start a fellowship. Think back. This is why I'm talking about restoration of your, your, your thoughts about. Think back how God was with Adam. Think about God with Adam. Think about Genesis chapter 1. He and Adam walked together in the Garden of Eden. There was fellowship. There was a friendship. That's what God wants with you. And if you want God's restorative power in your life, you have to stay in the, in the, in the, in the present. You have to get in the presence. First of all, you need to get in the presence. And in order to get in the presence, you got to spend time. It is not going to work if you don't get in the presence of God. That's where we fall short a lot of times, you know. We fall short because we don't get into the presence. If you picture a fountain, picture a fountain flowing, and we always we, we, we talk about you know God's um, anointing being like a fountain, like that living water. Jesus talked about the living water. Think about God as the fountain of healing for your soul, and in order to drink from that, you need to come close to the fountain. You can't stand. 10 feet away from the fountain and drink it's you might get dregs but when you come into the presence in the throne room in that time of worship in that time of spending time in that time of of adoration and when you worship 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 draws you in as i was saying in the other live before the power of praise and worship worship draws you in it draws you in closer and closer and closer and closer and every time you worship you're getting closer and god is gonna let you in closer and let you in closer and as you're coming closer into the presence you're tasting more and more you're drinking from the throne room you're drinking from the fountain you're gonna get healed the healing power is in the presence when that anointing comes upon you when the anointing of the presence of god flows he gonna fix he gonna heal he gonna restore all that brokenness inside of you but you have to be in the presence and that brings me to my last point it brings me to my last point the final point of restoration is create the atmosphere for God to dwell. You need to recreate the Garden of Eden in your life. You need to recreate the Garden of Eden in your life in order for God to dwell. Psalm 91, 1 and 2, popular psalm, and it says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Dwells. What does it mean to dwell? The Hebrew word yashab, it conveys a sense of settling, continuing, your remaining. So this is my final point. When we've let go of all the stuff, when we've let go of all the strongholds, when we let go of all the things and we come now and letting go so as i said before let's picture it we had the wound that that was inflicted in our life and then the enemy came and built on top of that he cemented that stronghold so in order so when we let go of the unforgiveness it exposes the wound yes so we have the original wound here so what's going to happen here now this is where the anointing and the presence of god is going to come in and be the healing balm to close up that wound now and make you whole so you understand how it works? First, we need to take off the stronghold. We need to do our part. Let go of the, the lies and whatever enemy says in our life. And, he, you know, he used those lies to build that stronghold. We need to rip that off. 
And when we rip it off, it leaves that raw wound. And it hurts. Restoration hurts, you know, guys. When you are at the feet of God and you are exposing all this pain, it is painful. I have. Let me tell you, when you are at the feet of God, you you can boil your, boil your life up because guess what? It hurts. It's like you're living it all over again. But, but, this is where the wound is exposed. It's, it's, it's open. It's bare. You lay it bare before your father. And the power of God is going to rest upon that wound like the healing balm. He is the healing balm that's going to heal up the wounds in your soul. Son of God, daughter of God, God is going to heal the wounds in your soul. First, you're going to have to understand to let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, and forgive and, 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 and say, I want to be healed. Spend time. Create that space. What is the atmosphere God dwells in? Simple. God said he dwells in the praises of his people. Worship, I always tell people, I, 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 I tell people worship, it's such a simple key. Your heart, and it's not about singing with your mouth and dancing whole day, no. A worship atmosphere is a heart stance. It's where you create a worship atmosphere in your heart for God to dwell, for him to live inside of you, for him to, his presence, you must remain in the courts of God. You know, the Bible talks about the courts of heaven, the courts come into his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise. And the problem is that we come in and we go out. We come in and we go out. So we get into the presence and then we run back out because we're busy and we have all these things to do in life and we, we miss out. But if your heart is always you're going through your day, you build a relationship with God and you're walking with him daily and you have that closeness with him, you want to stay in the presence of God where his healing power can continually restore. And as I said, it takes time. It may take years, but God is going to do it. He who started a good work in you is faithful and just to complete it. So those are the seven steps to restoration. Stay in the presence. Don't go nowhere. There's nothing else for you outside it. Stay in the presence. Stay in the presence. You know, somebody said to me, and I was like, well, you know, it's so sad to know that believers could feel like this. Somebody said, I really need to go to church so I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, boy. If you need to go to church to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, that means you need to buck up on your relationship with God. Because you need to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit right where you are, in your home, in your mind, in your body. In your, in, you need to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit at all times. And if you don't feel it, that means you need to up your relationship. You need to go higher. God said, come up higher. Come up here. You need to go up higher in the Spirit. And if you go up higher in the Spirit, by prayer by worship, by spending time with God, by reading the word, I guarantee you that over course of time, your soul will be healed. It will be healed. And as I said, it don't happen overnight. It takes time. And if you are in the process of being healed and there are still things to be healed, take what I'm saying to you that God ain't done with you yet. He's still working and he's going to continue to work. So trust him, trust his process, surrender. I really pray it is already 837. My goodness. I don't know how to make my messages any shorter than an hour. I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> I need to learn. But God is so good. He, you know, he's placed so much inside of me and I'm, I'm excited to share because as I said, it's things that I've actually done in my life. I'm not just talking from talking sake. I am speaking from living it. God has restored so much in my life. So much, so much, so much. I'm no longer that insecure person I used to be, you know. I tell you, I tell you, I'm not ashamed to say it. In my relationship with my husband, I was the most insecure person. I always wondering, I want to check his phone. I want to, I want to, you know, wonder where he is all the time. If he didn't call me, I was insecure. I was full, like fearful that something's going to happen. Let me tell you something. I am so, such a, in a healed place right now. I don't, I am so unbothered. I am not insecure anymore. I'm very secure because God healed that wound in my soul. But I let him do it and I did my part. I had to do my part. I had to face my demons. I had to let it go. And I had to recondition my mind to believe that I am now a son. A, sorry, I'm now a daughter of God. And you need to understand. We are sons, we are daughters. So next time you're tempted to tell yourself, I'm just human, uh-uh, you ain't just human. 
You are human. You are divinely human. You are divinely human. You are a mixture of humanity and divinity. And every time you find yourself slipping back to that place of condemning yourself, remind yourself you are a son and you are a daughter of the living God. And restoration is your portion. You need to say that every day as you get up. Restoration of my soul is my portion in the name of Jesus. And let him work in your life. So I pray that this message bless you. I really pray that it touch you. I repeat, that you go ahead and do it because the Lord say, become doers of the word and not just hearers. That's the key. Let's become doers. So we bless the Lord tonight. Let me just close off in a word of prayer and we're going to close off for tonight. Father, I thank you, my Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Oh, I praise your name, Jesus. You are such a good father. You are so wonderful. Hallelujah. Father, I join together tonight with everyone who is on this live tonight, your sons and your daughters. And I thank you, God, for that relationship you have restored us to. I bless your holy name tonight, Jesus. You are so good and wonderful. And Father, I thank you for this word tonight, my God. I thank you because your word is true. Your word is yea and amen. You cannot lie. So, Father, even as the word has gone forth, I pray right now, God, that you confirm your word with signs and wonders in the life of everyone who has received this word tonight. Let your anointing reign tonight, my God, to do miracle signs and wonders of healing restoration in the souls of every listener who is listening tonight, my God, that they will be restored toward my God. They will be healed, my God. They will be whole, my Jesus. In you tonight, I thank you for doing it. I trust you. I believe you. And I believe in faith that it is done. And I give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. Hallelujah. Jesus. God is so good. He's so good. You know, I, I always say that the reason I chose to serve God is because I saw his goodness in my life. The Bible said it's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. And if you tonight have not yet accepted the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in prayer tonight right where you are. The book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved because with your heart you believe unto righteousness and with your mouth you confess for salvation. So tonight, right where you are, if you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want to believe and trust Jesus tonight, it's so simple. So just, just, just say this prayer with me tonight and believe. Father, I thank you that you are God. I believe as your word said, I confess with my mouth that you are God, Jesus, that you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe in my heart that you came, that you died, and that you, Lord, were risen, and you are the risen King, and you are seated on the right hand of God right now. And Father, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I open up my heart right now, and I ask, Lord Jesus, that you come into my heart right now and be my God. And and right there where you are, as you say that prayer, God is going to accept you as his kingdom child. And he's going to give you that seal of his Holy Spirit right there. You're going to become a son and a daughter of the living God. So if you have said that prayer, I welcome you into the kingdom of God tonight. So guys, that's it for me tonight. Like and share this live. I won't be on for the next two weeks because I'm taking a little break. I'm taking a little vacation, much needed so i'll be back on at the end of the month the last wednesday in the month but i pray that this really has done great wonders for you tonight so everyone have a blessed and wonderful night and i'll see you back here at the end of the month take care